So welcome back to unit six on learning module 26, how we learn and classical conditioning. And oh, thank goodness we've had a little bit of trouble here in Northern California with fires and wind and power being out and we have not had our internet for several days. So I am delayed from where I wanna be in posting this, but um, better late than never, right? Okay. So we have quite a few learning targets for this module. Um, but a lot of this stuff might, some of the terms seem complicated, but they're really, really simple if you think through them. Um, and they are really important to understand in terms of AP, the, the AP psychology exam. So I really think you should take some time and really get to understand the terms within this module. So the first, learning target is to be able to define learning and identify some basic forms of learning. The second one is to be able to explain behaviorism's view of learning. I'd be able to identify Ivan Pavlov, um, think dogs, and describe the basic components of classical conditioning. So when you think Pavlov, you should be thinking classical conditioning. You should be able at the end of this module to identify the processes of acquisition, extinction, spontaneous recovery, generalization, and discrimination. Those are kind of some of the terms I was talking about, and they seem more complicated than they are as we talk about them in this module. Hopefully it'll become clearer as, as to what they are. Um, you should be able to summarize why Pavlov's work remains so important, and it does. I've just actually this week read two articles about, actually about artificial, artificial intelligence, and they were related to both Pavlov's work and B.F. Skinner's work, who we will talk about with an operant conditioning. Um, and finally, in this module, the last learning target is to be able to describe some applications of Pavlov's work to human health and well-being and explain how John Watson applied, took all of Pavlov's ideas, um, uh, took all of his principles and applied them to learned fears. So what is learning? We toss that a word, word around all the time. Hopefully we think we're doing it. <laughs> um, but in terms of psychology, the term learning is the process of acquiring through experience new and relatively enduring information or behaviors. So the emphasis here is on enduring. Learning, learning is different than just cramming and forgetting the information. Learning is enduring change. To truly learn is to own the knowledge, skill, or idea. So what are some ways that we learn? If we're thinking about this from the perspective of a psychologist, how do we learn? Well, we learn to expect and prepare for significant events such as food or pain. This is classical conditioning. There's also operant conditioning where we learn to repeat acts that bring rewards and we learn to avoid acts that bring unwanted results that punish us. We want to avoid punishment and we want to repeat things that bring us rewards or um, things that we really want. So Observational learning, we also learn by observing events in other people. We copy them, we see what they're doing, you know, and we often take in some of what they're doing and incorporate it into our own behavior. And then finally, cognitive learning. We learn things we nev have never experienced or observed. And that's important to, to be able to differentiate between some of the behavioral types of learning, the conditioning, classical and operant conditioning, and even observational versus the cognitive learning. So what is associative learning? Learning that certain events occur together. They're associated. That's a simple, it sounds, it sounds more complicated than it is. Associative learning is just that certain things are associated with each other. The events may be two stimuli, as in classical conditioning, or a response and its consequence. So that would be um, aligned with operant conditioning. So the classical conditioning versus the operant conditioning. These associations, associations can be positive or negative. So how do positive associations factor in learning? We tend to connect positive events when they occur in a sequence. So if you hang out with like a new group of classmates during lunch and you have a great time laughing, the next time that group asks you to join them for lunch, 
you'll associate them with fun and good times and eagerly wanting to meet up with them. And that can go for all kinds of things, like going to a, a restaurant that you like the food, you're gonna associate it with, oh, that was a great place, this was a good time especially if you took some good friends with you. You know, it's just making associations between um, different events. So how do negative associations factor into learning? We tend to connect negative events when they occur in sequence. If you put your hand on a hot stove and the heat burns you and causes you pain, you associate the stove with pain. And then the next time, hopefully, you'll be more careful. And this happens a lot with little kids, right? You hope. Um, <laughs> I remember learning hearing all the time that, um, especially my one younger son, he had a hard time with some things and has some impulsivity and he wouldn't, you know, oh, as soon as he falls down the steps one time, he won't go over there again. Well, he did, but it took him a little bit longer to learn and we had to put up a gate in the meantime. But theoretically, um, if you burn your hand on the stove, you're not, you're gonna understand that after the first time and not wanna do it again. So this is how we learn. So what are two types of associative learning? The classical versus operant conditioning. Class in classical conditioning, we learn to associate two stimuli and thus anticipate events. So the stimuli are things we do not control and that we respond automatically. So these are sort of involuntary responses. So we're not in control of them, we're just responding volu involuntarily. Op in operant conditioning, we learn to associate a response, our behavior, with its consequence. Right? So if we do something really, really nice for, um, and are very polite, you know, when we're younger kids, we might end up getting praise or, you know, some sort of tangible reinforcement like um, a piece of chocolate or something like that. The behavior is voluntary. We choose the behavior ourselves, and we operate on the environment to produce a consequence. So how do associations lead to habits? Learned associations also feed our habitual behavior. And this can be good or bad. Sometimes we want to develop habits and sometimes we want to break our habits. So the reason so many of us eat po uh, popcorn and the movie theater is we've come to associate the movie theater with buttery popcorn. Okay. Sorry, I had to get my dogs um, put somewhere where we can't hear them barking. So again, we walk into the movie theater, we smell that popcorn, we are associating it in the movie theater and popcorn, and we think we have to eat popcorn at the movie. Um, for some people, that might be a really hard habit to break. Um, when you enter a movie theater, it might be automatic, I want popcorn! I know my older son is like that. Um, and the rest of us, not as much. My husband, a little bit, but I've sort of broken that that habit because I have a tendency to just eat the entire bag when I go. I lose, con I lose control of being able to stop my buttery popcorn eating when I'm in the theater. How do associations lead to a term called habituation? So other animals also learn by association, not just humans. Disturbed by a squirt of water, something an organism is fairly simple, is a sea slug protectively withdraws its gill. If the squirts continue, as happens naturally in choppy water, the withdrawal response diminishes. We say the slug habituates, and we often have heard, you may have heard that term before, used with infants habituating to things. But if the sea slug repeatedly receives an electric shock just after being squirted, its protective response to the squirt instead grows stronger. The animal has associated the squirt with the impending shock. So habituation is what happens when repeated stimulation produces waning responsiveness. So you sort of stop responding if you habituate to something. In the sea slug's case, he just got used to the squirts from the choppy water, just as you might get used to the cold ocean water after you've been in it for a while, right? Are you one of those people that can walk into the ocean or jump in right away even though it's freezing? Or does it take you a while to acclimate? I'm the second type um, or in the swimming pool. But usually after a while, you get fairly used to the water when at first it may have been freezing. So there are some differences between the term habituation versus sensory adaptation that we talked about in sensation and perception. Habituation is a type of learning or relatively permanent change in behavior that involves a reduced response as a result of repeated but not constant exposure. On the other hand, sensory adaptation is a perceptual phenomenon that occurs when the brain stops recognizing a constant and unchanging stimulus. 
So what is a stimulus? <laughs> Any event or situation that evokes a response. So for the sea slug, the stimulus was the squirt from the choppy water, ocean waters, or the electric shock from the researcher. For the popcorn eater, the stimulus was the movie theater. The stimulus as a human would have been you walking into the movie theater and you just immediately associate the fact that you need to buy popcorn. A response is the behavior that follows the stimulus. For the sea slug, the involuntary behavior was the shirking. That's classical conditioning. For the popcorn eater, the voluntary behavior was the purchasing of an eating popcorn. So how do we define classical conditioning? It's a type, of a type of associative learning that involves learned and voluntary processes. So we associate stimuli that we do not control and we respond automatically. Involuntary responses include things like salivation, blinking, sweating, cringing, or automatically, automatic bodily reactions to strong emotions such as fear. So how does it occur? So this is an example. We learn that a flash of lightning signals an impending crack of thunder. These two events typically occur together in sequence. So we associate thunderbolts with lightning and we get scared, especially if we're younger, or lots of times you can see dogs get really scared um, of thunder. Because we have associated lightning with thunder, we expect to have one when we have the other. So we kind of get used to expecting them to show up together. So upon seeing a crash of lightning, we automatically might respond by tensing and anticipating the loud thunder boom. So what about operant conditioning? So it's a little bit different. We learn to associate a response and its consequence, what immediately follows our behavior. So thus we and other animals, that's a really important thing to remember about these behavioral principles that we're not just talking about humans, they're supposed to be applicable across all different animal species as well. So thus we and other animals learn to repeat voluntary acts followed by good results and avoid voluntary acts followed by bad results, right? So we try to avoid things that are punished and we try to repeat things that are followed by um, good results. These associations produce operant behaviors, which operate on the environment to produce a consequence. So how does it really occur? We learn that a voluntary behavior or response of politeness, for example, is associated with a consequence of receiving a cookie, right? So it might, the thought is that, you know, giving a child or someone a cookie would elicit that behavior would, would make it more like, if the person wants the cookie that is, <laughs> it makes it more likely for them to elicit that behavior in the future. So the next time the opportunity presents itself, we repeat the voluntary behavior that had the positive consequence the last time. We associate the behavior with its con consequence. So what are the respondent behaviors and what are operant behaviors? Respondent behaviors behaviors that occur as an automatic response to some stimulus, um, like the woman who was tensing for the thunder boom. Operant behaviors are behaviors that operate on the environment producing consequences, like the boy saying please. So do, these, do, so do classical and operant conditioning work together? Yes. So here's an example from a Japanese cattle ranch. Okay? There was a clever rancher who outfitted his herd with electronic pagers, which he called from his cell phone. Pretty high-tech cattle ranching. After a week of training, the animals learned to associate two stimuli, the beep of their pager and the arrival of food, the classical conditioning. But they also learned to associate their hustling to the food um, with the pleasure of eating. That would be operant conditioning because they're getting that reward, which this simplified the rancher's work. So what is behaviorism's view of learning? According to John B. Watson, who's sort of thought of as the father of behaviorism in the United States, the science of psychology should study how organisms, not just humans, organisms respond to stimuli in their environments. Psychology's goal is the prediction and control of behavior. Introspection forms no essential part of its methods. Now remember, this is the behaviorist perspective. This is John Watson here speaking. Simply said to Watson and other behaviorists, psychology should be an objective science based only on observable behavior. They did not, they, behaviorists were not interested in what was going on inside what they can call the black box inside your brain. They didn't think that was anything that we could ever figure out and they felt, they feel, they're still behaviorists, 
that the whole entire focus of psychology should be on observable behavior. And there he is, Ivan Pavlov. Pavlov's work actually laid out the foundation for many of John B. Watson's ideas. Um, he wasn't a psychologist. I believe he was a Russian physiologist studying the salivation, saliv you know, salivation reflexes within dogs. Um, both Pavlov and Watson believed the basic laws of learning were the same for all animals, as I said before, whether sea slugs or dogs or humans. They thought there were fundamental basic principles of learning that could be applied across different species of animals. So Pavlov spent two decades studying dogs' digestive systems, and he actually earned a Nobel Prize. His experiments on learning produced the phenomenon we call classical conditioning. So from doing research in the field of like dog physiology, he ended up coming up with the, the phenomenon of classical conditioning that we understand and apply within behaviorism as a one of the principles, one of the ways we think conceptualize learning. So Pavlov's initial work here, he attached a tube in the dog's cheek to collect saliva, which was measured in a cylinder outside of a chamber. So you kind of look at that for a second. See what's going on. So what was his accidental discovery? So without fail, putting food in a dog's mouth caused the animal to salivate. We can probably understand that. And we see that, can feel that happening within, our, within ourselves. But the dog began salivating not only to the taste of the food, but also to the mere sight of the food or the food dish or the person delivering the food or even at the sound of that person's approaching footsteps. If you have, an, if you have a pet of any kind, you probably have recognized this, right? As soon as I would open the drawer, and we used to have a cat and we have dogs now and I, there are lots of examples as well, but I specifically remember um, when we had a cat and we would open the drawer that had the can opener in it, she would start meowing like crazy because as soon as I would start opening the drawer, she would anticipate that food would be coming. She associated the opening of the drawer with the food coming. Um, and Pavlov was like, wow, this is really interesting. He realized this behavior pointed to a simple but fundamental form of learning. So what are the components of classical conditioning that he came up with? So if we look at these terms, the, the unconditioned stimulus produces an unconditioned response. So this just happens naturally. So the food at first in the dog's mouth just produces salivation, just naturally. That's the way that we're made um, as animals. A neutral stimulus initially, like a bell or a... Um, tuning fork, is that what that's called right here? Right here, um, initially produces no salivation. The sound produces no salivation. That's the, originally the neutral stimulus produces a no salivation response. But then if the tone, um, which he used bells a lot, he ended up doing many different trials of many different methods. But when he used a tone and he paired it with the food, it would, the, the dog would then salivate. So he found that if he combined those two, the neutral stimulus with the food, it would produce the salivation. Then he realized that he could just make the sound, the tone by itself, and it would produce salivation. So the tone became the conditioned stimulus and the salivation based on the conditioned stimulus became the conditioned response. So how are the unconditioned stimulus and unconditioned response related? So food in the mouth automatically, unconditionally triggers a dog's salivary reflex. No training is required for this automatic involuntary response. So this is called the unconditioned response. Pavlov didn't have to do anything to make that happen. He called the food the unconditioned stimulus. The neutral stimulus, the tone or bell when activated, produced no response at first. Pavlov's Pavlov called the bell or the tuning fork buzzer, whatever he was using in the particular trial, the neutral stimulus, because it initially elicited no salivation. But then Pavlov conducted these multiple trials and paired the neutral stimulus with the food, which um, the unconditioned stimulus of the food, though, it, though is what continues to produce the unconditioned response of the drool salivation. 
So even though at first it was the neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus that produced the salivation, what he found was that um, after this relationship is learned, salivation in response to a tone is learned. It is conditional upon the dogs associating the tone with the food. This response becomes the conditioned response. The neutral stimulus now triggers salivation and is called the conditioned stimulus. It's no longer the neutral stimulus. It has been made into a conditioned stimulus. So I just said a whole lot of words there. <laughs> so let's do a little bit of a comprehension check. In classical conditioning, the conditioned stimulus is, to read through those. It's C, is initially neutral and then comes to trigger an involuntary response. So in terms of an AP exam tip, if you are gonna take the AP exam, understanding these components of Pavlov's classical conditioning, these are important. Um, practice with many different scenarios that you can think about, identify the unconditioned stimulus, conditioned stimulus, neutral stimulus, unconditioned response, and conditioned response. Another comprehension check. Students are accustomed to a bell ringing to indicate the end of a class period. The principal decides to substitute popular music for the bell to indicate the end of each class period. Students quickly respond to the music in the same way they did to the bell. In this example, the music is a, so let's look at this. It's a conditioned stimulus, right? Because they're learning that the, the music is the, same as what the bell was. So they've been conditioned to, rea to react to the new stimulus in the way that they reacted to the old one. So what is acquisition? In classical conditioning, the initial stage when one links a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus, so the neutral stimulus begins triggering the conditioned involuntary response. So in operant conditioning, the strengthening of a reinforced response or the decreasing of a punished response. How does classical conditioning support reproduction? So just before presenting an approachable female quail, researchers turned on a red light. Over time, the red light signaled the male quail to become excited. Conditioning helps an animal survive and reproduce by responding to cues that help it gain food, avoid dangers, locate mates, and produce offspring. What about higher order conditioning? A procedure in classical conditioning in which the conditioned stimulus in one conditioning experience is paired with a new neutral stimulus creating a second, often weaker, conditioned stimulus. For example, an animal that has learned that a tone predicts food might then learn that a light predicts the tone and be begin responding to the light alone. This is sometimes called second order conditioning. So second order conditioning and higher order conditioning are the same thing. So what if a, an unconditioned stimulus is no longer presented? So Pavlov wondered if the tone sounded again and again, but no food appeared. So after these dogs had been conditioned to expecting food after the tone, what would happen if he then just presented the tone again and again, but no food appeared? Would the tone still trigger salivation? So what he found was that extinction could occur when an unconditioned stimulus does not follow a conditioned stimulus. So in this case, when food no longer follows the bell, the salivation response grows much, much weaker. However, an interesting thing can occur called spontaneous recovery. The reappearance, the reappearance after a pause of an extinguished conditioned response can occur. And this term is important to know that even though something, a, be, a response has been dis extinguished, there is the possibility of spontaneous recovery. So here's an AP exam tip. Extinction and spontaneous recovery are two terms that frequently occur on the AP exam. It is key that you establish extinction has occurred before spontaneous recovery. In other words, make sure if you're doing an FRQ that, and you're writing it that 
the reader understands that you know that the conditioned stimulus no longer produces the conditioned response. So when we're talking about the bell and the salivation, then a pause occurs of days or weeks without the food coming and then and the um, salivation stops happening. Then spontaneously, the conditioned response occurs again without any relearning or repairing with the unconditioned stimulus, which would be the meat. So what is generalization? The tendency, once a response has been conditioned for stimuli, similar to, similar to the conditioned stimulus to elicit similar responses. So if Pavlov's dog learned to salivate to a tone, and the researcher then rang a bell or played a note on a flute, it may be that the dog drools to those stimuli as well. We would say the dog has generalized his responses to the stimulus. So how did Pavlov go about demonstrating generalization? He attached miniature vibrators to various parts of a dog's body. After conditioning salivation to stimulation of the thigh, he stimulated other areas of the dog's body. The closer a stimulated spot was to the dog's thigh, the stronger the conditioned response. As you can see from this visualization to the right. Discrimination is the learned ability to distinguish between a conditioned stimulus and similar sounding, similar things, similar stimuli that do not signal an unconditioned stimulus. So if Pavlov only presented the food after the bell, but not the tone, tuning fork or buzzer, the dog would learn to discriminate between the sounds and only drool to the bell. That is the process of discrimination. So why does Pavlov's work remain so important? Well, he taught us the significant psychological phenomena can be studied objectively. So he really didn't do anything where he was looking at what the thoughts are of the dog and that kind of thing. He was looking all at observable behavior. And that classical conditioning is a basic form of lear learning that can be applied to all species. So how about some applications of Pavlov? So former drug users often feel a craving when they are again in the drug using context with people or places they associate with previous highs. This can be really problematic and um, make it difficult for people that are recovering drug addicts to hang out with the people that they used to hang out with. People who struggle with their weight often have eaten unhealthy foods thousands of times, leaving them with strongly conditioned responses to eat the very foods that will keep them in poor health. When a particular taste accompanies a drug that influences immune responses, the taste by itself may come to produce an immune response, fascinatingly. So how did John Watson take Pavlov's ideas and apply them to fears? So Pavlov's work provides a basis for Watson's ideas that human emotions and behaviors, though biologically influenced, are mainly a bundle of conditioned responses. Watson, you may have heard of John Watson with little Albert. He applied these principles from Pavlov, these classical conditioning principles in his studies at Johns Hopkins University to demonstrate how specific fears can be conditioned. This is an actual image of John Watson, little baby Albert, and Rosalie Rayner, who was one of um, Watson's graduate students, who I believe he went on to marry later on. John Watson and his graduate assistant, Rosalie Rayner, conditioned little Albert to fear a white rat after repeatedly experiencing a loud noise as the rat was presented. Poor little Albert. After seven repeats of seeing the rat and hearing a frightening like gong-like noise, Albert burst into tears at the mere sight of a rat. And if you um, want to see, there are lots of videos of this just on YouTube of the little Albert experience and some actual footage are a little blurry, but because it's old, but it's really interesting to take a look at them. How did little Albert generalize his learning? Five days later, he had generalized the startled fear reaction to the sight, not only of a rat, but to a rabbit, a dog, a seal skin coat, but he learned to discriminate and not to dim dissimilar objects such as toys. Oh, that was a lot of information. So let's go over these learning targets. So learning is the process of acquiring new information or behaviors through experience. In associative learning, we learn that certain events occur together. In classical conditioning, a type of associative learning, we learn to associate two or more stimuli. Automatically responding to stimuli we do not control is called respondent behavior. In operant conditioning, we learn to associate a response and its consequences, which produce operant behaviors. 
Through cognitive learning, we acquire mental information that guides our behavior. We didn't talk that much about cognitive behavior, cognitive learning um, within this presentation. We will be doing so more in the next few modules. In observational learning, we learn, again, we didn't talk that much about observational learning, but a tiny bit. We learn new behaviors by observing events and watching and mimicking others. Pavlov's work on classical conditioning laid the foundation for behaviorism. Even though Pavlov was not a psychologist, his work on classical conditioning laid the groundwork for this very influential field of behaviorism that really dominated a lot of the, especially the early half of the 20th century, but even beyond in terms of many things, child development, education, you know, how we approach a lot of things in terms of animal training <laughs> within psychology. The view that psychology should be an objective science that studies behavior without reference to mental processes. The behaviorist believes that the basic laws of learning are the same for all species, including humans. So Pavlov is the one who came up with the ideas of classical conditioning and as a form of learning. Classical conditioning is a type of learning in which an organism comes to associate stimuli and anticipate events. An unconditioned response is an event that occurs naturally in response to a stimulus. So that salivation that occurred after the food was just presented, that's a naturally occurring response. An unconditioned stimulus is something that naturally and automatically triggers the unlearned response. So that would be the food in that case. A conditioned stimulus is originally a neutral stimulus that was the tuning fork or the bell after association with an unconditioned stimulus that comes to trigger the conditioned response of salivation. A conditioned response is the learned response to the originally neutral stimulus. So in the case of the Pavlov experience, originally the tuning fork was a neutral stimulus, but it changed into a conditioned stimulus um, after it had been paired with the food and the food was taken away, and it elicited then a conditioned response, that salivation. So the first stage of, a, is of, of classical conditioning is acquisition, associating a neutral stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus so that the neutral stimulus begins to trigger that conditioned response of salivation. Acquisition occurs best when the neutral stimulus is presented just before the unconditioned stimulus. This supports that classical condition is biologically adaptive, through higher order conditioning, a new um, neutral stimulus can become a new conditioned response. Extinction is diminished responding. It occurs if the conditioned stimulus appears repeatedly by itself without the conditioned response. Spontaneous recovery is the appearance of a formally extinguished response following a rest period. Generalization is a tendency to respond to stimuli that are similar to a conditioned stimulus, and discrimination is the learned ability to distinguish between a conditioned stimulus and other similar stimuli. So why is Pavlov's work still so important? He taught us that significant psychological phenomena could be studied objectively, and that classical conditioning is a basic form of learning that applies to all species. Classical conditioning techniques are used to improve human health and well-being in many areas. Like I said, even now, um, behavioral principles are being used within the field of things, you know, as futuristic as artificial intelligence. The body's immune system may also respond to classical conditioning, which is a really fascinating phenomenon. Finally, Pavlov's work provided a basis for Watson's idea that human emotions and behaviors though biologically influenced, are mainly a bundle of conditioned responses. Watson applied classical conditioning principles in his studies of Little Albert to demonstrate how specific fears might be conditioned. And remember, with the Little Albert experience, Watson and his graduate student, Rosalie Rayner, initially conditioned Little Albert to be afraid of a rat by playing a frightening bell as they showed the rat. And then that initially, then the that initial fear to the rat generalized to other white furry things. Okay, it's a pretty long one. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Take care.